Or are you going to figure no. it out? Uh, well, it's okay. I, I'm going to rename it anyway. Okay. All right. So, yeah, any questions anyone might have? Dave, can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> I'm Tom from uh, the Chemeketa Planetarium in Salem, Oregon. Um, mm -hmm. On your uh, one slide, you talk about an interactive planetarium show, which to me means that the speaker is interacting with the audience. Uh, is my image correct or did I miss something? Okay. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, the speaker and the audience are interacting with each other. So, uh, and so there is a prepared script that the uh, presenter has and it can be changed and you are pretty much trying to enlighten the audience uh, based upon what new science or science that uh, Noah or whoever is being being shared with. So um, how, how does that go? I mean, um, how, do you, how do you measure the success of whether you're communicating it? Is it simply the dialogue? That's a great question. How do we measure the success of what we're doing? And in this case, with this grant and in previous grants that we have, we do at the Science Center have a um, data collection uh, group that put together survey questions that help us find out how we're doing. And in the coming weeks, they will be introduced to this. What I do when I'm prototyping shows is uh, I will do the show and I will tell people this is a prototype. We're trying to create this show. And if anyone is interested in staying after the show uh, to answer a few questions and I'll get some great feedback from our audience on what they liked, what they didn't like, what to have more of. Uh, and I'll ask, uh, Ide the ideal audience to do that is a family with adults, teens, and uh, children as well, so that you can get everybody's perspective. That's not always the case, but you get a lot of good feedback. And uh, as Laura Grace uh, did the program as well, she got some great feedback and fed it back to me. And it's just sort of an ongoing thing from a day-to-day as we do all of our shows, because all of our shows are live interactive, I put that in the title slides because we get a not insignificant group of guests who expect a movie. They've never they've been to planetariums before, but they've never seen a 100% live show um, because there are. There are planetariums that do it. There are a lot of planetariums that don't. And a lot of people have only been in the planetariums that just show movies all day long. So I throw that in there to at least start training the audience, as it were, to know that this is something you're going to be involved in as well. And it comes with the uh, training of the staff and their ability to judge the audience and know what's going, know how the audience is reacting, and also their ability to, if, a, if an audience is interested in a certain subject area and are asking questions, to stay with that and to be able to go off the script and go with what the, uh, that particular audience wants to spend all of their time talking about Greenland. Spend all your time talking about Greenland then or at least to what you have the knowledge to be able to do and try to bring it back to the thought line that we have. And I'm not sure if I actually just answered that question. No, you did. And, and that's very en enlightening. It's a, it would, to me, to, to manage th that kind of a show would be quite a challenge because you never know who your audience is if they're drop in. And, and you don't know whether your staff has the depth uh, to talk about Greenland. Uh, because it came up. So uh, I, I applaud you. It, it, that's, uh, you know, doing a movie is a safe way to make money and to do our job, so to speak. So I commend you. Yeah, it's, um, 
It's exciting and it is a challenge and I spend a lot of time checking in with uh, each one of the performers, seeing what they need, what they want, trying to give them the time to be able to research the things that they are questioning about. And also make sure that they know that it's okay to say, I don't know. Uh, and to use that even as a teaching moment because you know, one of the things I like to uh, talk about is, you know, how many scientific discoveries, and I got this idea from an uh, old supervisor and mentor of mine, Eddie Goldstein, if anyone knows Eddie, um, who's like, you know, how many scientists, scientific discoveries start out with, huh, I wonder why it did that. And, you know, that's a big part of teaching science is just the whole process. We don't have all the answers. Thanks, Dave. Great. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, this is John from the Hello. Lawrence Hall of Science Planetarium. Hello. Um, and I'm thinking about how in our interactive shows, a lot of times, whether we do know an answer or don't know an answer, the, we let the planetarium answer for us. And I'm trying to think in your program that you're talking about today, when and how that can work and when and how that might be more challenging. I'm, I'm thinking of the science on a sphere segments you have where you can say, well, let's look at that again or explore and see what it shows us, whether the presenter really knows the details of an answer or not. Or do you have any other instances in a show like yours where you can let the data inform rather than the presenter answer a question? Yes, I'm trying to think of us. I know, I, I think I know what you're asking and I'm trying to think of some good solid examples of and, that. And that's a challenging thing to throw at you for a particular show like this. So yeah, um, I'll acknowledge this, that. This show is a lot better with questions. This show is a lot, is much, I mean, all shows are, but this one in particular, it's a very content heavy show. And for a while there, I actually hit a wall with it. So I was really glad that uh, Laura Grace was right at about the time that I was ready to throw it away and start over. Uh, she was like, oh no, let me try it. Let me work on it. And she sort of brought it home for me. Um, but, um, it is, it's kind of a fire hose of information, the way the show is. So it really works better when it is broken up by guests and you don't necessarily get through everything. I'm trying, I, I have specific examples to answer your question, but I'm kind of drawing a blank on what those are. Let me think of it as we continue. And maybe by the end of the meeting, I'll have an answer for you. I see that Jeff Nee unmuted. I wonder if he had something to say. Yeah. Jeff? Oh, hey, Dave. Uh, I just had a pretty specific question of, of how easy or how difficult was it to work with the 360 uh, media in Uniview and Nightshade? Uh, in Nightshade, it is uh, various, and both uh, Uniview and Nightshade is very easy. In Nightshade, I can plug a thumb drive into the Digitarium and hit a button and it projects it. Uh, Uniview, you can drag and drop a lot of things into your dome space and it uh, shows up. It's, uh, you have a, I wouldn't say you have less control in Uniview than you do Nightshade, but you have different control in the both of them and they both have advantages and disadvantages uh, in different areas to work in. Um, the biggest challenge is doing it in Uniview. I started putting in, uh, and for those of you who are familiar with Uniview, it is a panel show. And I, I was at the end of, it's about a seven panel show. It actually loads pretty quickly right now. Uh, but the right now is key because as I created a panel for each scientist, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do that and just have it because I wanted one show so that as you go through, if someone, and this is part to answer some of uh, the earlier question was as you go through, if a guest has a question that might be, you know, that might be covered by one of the scientist sections that you're not talking about, you would have the information in there to go to. Um, so I quickly took that out of the Uniview and uh, I'm gonna have, so I don't have to go back and forth between the two. I'm gonna be using, or so I don't have to quit out of one profile and launch another. I'm gonna go back and forth between the Uniview and the Nightshade just to limit the amount of memory in one program, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. I was only asking because, you know, I, uh, I'm trying to do some of the NASA 360 stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. and, and I got a question about, um, about a nightshade um, planetarium who didn't know how to import it. And I was like, well, I don't know. Um, but that I could just tell them it's really easy. That was actually me. And <laughs> that I don't have an answer for because now I know what you're talking about. Um, with... Uh, the um, with both Nightshade and uh, the Digitarium, the 360 camera that I have, I can take those and I can import those in in both either program in the same way that the seven minutes of terror video from JPL can run or anything like that. Downloading a 360, and that I think it was probably me because I was downloading a 360 uh, of, I think it was the Osiris Rex launch in a 360 camera. And I bring it in and I throw it up, and I can't get the Zenith where I want it. And since it was sort of for a side project that I was working on, I sort of set that aside. So we should talk because. I still can't figure that one out. Okay, I, I, it was it was another person asked me too. I, I remember you asked me a few months ago, but like literally last week, somebody asked me, oh, and uh, yeah, 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 and so and so I, I was I was really excited to talk to you because I I, th I thought you had figured it out, but um, but yeah, you're you're right. We should talk later. Yeah, we should talk later. I've got a couple of ideas and stuff based on a couple of things I've learned since I posted that, but I haven't fully gotten that one answered. Okay, thanks. We'll talk later. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Hey, this is Alan uh, yeah. at Berkeley. Um, I was wondering about that camera. You said you had an inexpensive camera. Uh, yeah. And the, for a small dome, being able to make a movie yourself is kind of a, a neat uh, capability to have. And at the, uh, at the mem, and I'm especially tuned into this because at the Memphis meeting, um, the uh, the SEPA WAC meeting, I went to Derek Derek's workshop about, mm -hmm. uh, where it cost two hundred dollars, and I got a camera out of it. And oh, it's wow. cool! Wow. So uh, I was wondering what kind of cam what what is the actual kind of camera that you have, and is it like a the one I have makes a three when it says three hundred sixty, it's everything up above and below. I'll go grab it. Yeah. Hang on, I'm, I'll be right back. Okay. Because then I have to, then I have some software that makes it just a hemisphere, um, and that that then can go on the dome. Well, Alan, what what camera? Since since David David's going to get his, what camera did you get at the workshop? Uh, it, it was a Rico Theta. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've heard of those. Yeah. Yeah, so Rico and, you know, I would, does the whole thing above and below, and then you have a, a, a software that makes it just half the hemisphere right. above. Right. This is it. It's called a 360 fly, and it's certainly 360 around, and it's close to 360. I figured out how to be below it, so I'm not out. So it doesn't do two true 360 360 in all uh dimensions but it does do 360 that you can 
have uh, landscape imagery and video up in the dome. And as long as you don't want to pivot down and look at your feet, uh, you'll be fine with it. And it is, uh, it's a nice little device. This was, uh, I think they were discontinuing this model uh, as they put out a 4K model. And I think I understand why they discontinued this one. It has more, I think, to do, there's a couple of weird software things that bug me that I bet they fixed, uh, but they're easy to work around and it takes decent uh, imagery that work for a small dome. And it was listing for, I think like $399, $499, but it was on Amazon new for 80 bucks. So, you know, our little hometown company here in Seattle, and I went ahead and uh, it's great. As a matter of fact, one of our uh, uh, marine biologists, the marine fisheries uh, scientist, one of the two, Robert, is uh, a week from Sunday going to fly up to catch up with the Healy that's going to be in the bearing. And next Wednesday, I'm going to meet with him show them how to use it and hand it off to them. It comes with, I've got it out on my desk, a supposedly watertight container. Uh, I'm gonna test that out a couple times before I test it out with the camera. But it's gonna go out to the ice a uh, couple of times. And when any of my uh, Southern Hemisphere uh, uh, scientists are going to go out. I'll send it out. So I'm hoping to get a lot of footage with this thing that will be acceptable for what we use. It's run off of a, I don't mean to sound like an ad for the thing because there might be better ones. This is just the one that I happen to find, but it's run off an app on your phone. So it's a pretty nice little thing. I was going to ask you uh, how much uh, time you were able to actually put into the the show using your um, uh, live video. Were you able to include a lot of that? With this, with the video that I just took, I haven't incorporated that yet. Oh, I just gosh. took that about two weeks ago, and I have I have a supervisor of the planetarium hat that I wear, and I have a super supervisor of the science interpretation program hat that I wear, and I've been wearing that hat a lot in the last couple of weeks, so I haven't been able to wear my planet. I much prefer having the planetarium hat on. I'm sure you all agree, but I've been having to wear the other hat a bit, but I'm hoping to get that footage uh, incorporated into the show within the next couple of weeks. And that's why I say it's going to be this ever-changing thing. When uh, Robert comes back from the ice at the end of August, I'm going to have more footage that will completely change the show again. And then another scientist is going out to a different part of the ice in September that I'm going to give it to him and he's going to take it out. Um, one, the woman who researches uh, diatoms under the ice, uh, on one of their trips, they just took a regular GoPro and dropped it in a waterproof case down into an ice hole. And it, it's not a 360 video, it's not a full dome video, but I make it full dome and you never, there's a couple of things that if you know what you're looking for, you know it's not, but it looks awesome and you get under the ice and you yeah. can see the, the algae clinging to the bottom of the ice and even yeah. some of the weird stalactite structures at the bottom of the ice. So this is just from a GoPro uh, that as these things happen, the show is built to change. Hopefully. <laughs> so will it just be one show that continually uh, gets changed and modified and added to and uh, progress? Or do you think you're gonna have enough stuff to maybe make a couple of shows out of it? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. The way the way the grant is written is that it is one show with eight or 12 add-ons of the scientists coming in to add on to the show. And I'll meet that requirement. I'm already meeting that requirement in a sense. Um, but we've got another two years essentially on this grant. 
And as I get better at what I'm doing, I've learned a lot on uh, how to create a bunch of stuff and that. And as more and more things come in, I imagine it will turn into a number of different shows. Yeah. But that I'm not going to commit to, but I imagine so. Sounds like it's a, if it's modularized like that, you've made something that can make different shows, you know, di different, like you already, you talked about different starts. Oh yeah. And having different scientists. So, yeah, uh, exactly. So it's going to be modular. different shows basically, different, yeah. same subject, but different shows. Yeah. And that, that allows it. I always allow, um, the uh, presenters to personalize their show. Uh, there's eight of us that do uh, The Sky Tonight, our observational astronomy show. They are all completely different Sky Tonights, depending on, well, first the sky, because um, each one of us have different favorite skies or different skies that we don't like, and um, different approaches to it. The same with, uh, I've got a show, it's your standard solar system tour show called The Planets. And, you know, it actually, it's about uh, zones. It views the planets in terms of close rocky planets, further gassy planets, icy zone kind of a thing. Uh, but it's a tour of the planets. It's your, you know, standard tour. I have uh, one presenter who, um, many of my presenters are actors. This one in particular is script on. He goes, his show goes straight with his spine and he does it and he can take questions too and he'll let me know how he answered the questions and everything and it works out really well. I have other presenters who are much more improvisational uh, and that works out as well. I have a show that's created just, I created it so that when I first got here, I wanted to be able to have guest scientists present. And I had a couple of opportunities with a local uh, research institute that has some scientists that work on uh, Rosetta and Dawn and on the Europa 2020 or whatever they're calling that now. Um, and I didn't have any place to plug them in. So I created a show that on the spur of a moment, if Stephen Hawking calls me up, well, he's dead now, so he's not going to, and says, hey, Dave, I want to do a show in your planetarium. Can I? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Here, here's the time tomorrow. We'll see you. And then he calls me the next morning saying, my God, traffic in Seattle is ridiculous. I'm never going to make it. And it could be something else. So I've got a show like that, that I allow people to explore their own interests uh, and also explore the guests' interests. So the whole way the planetarium works is that kind of interactivity. And there's a lot of trust in just letting, you know, at some point you gotta go, well, I might not have done it that way, but that's how it's going. There's a certain amount of trust I have to give to all of them. Pacific Planetarium? Uh, I, I want to say that Carl and Garth have the award for best background on their <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Inside. What are you doing inside on a beautiful day? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, it's where I have Wi-Fi access. <laughs> yeah. And also, we haven't heard from Garth, or let's see, the other person we haven't heard from is John, John Elbert. So if you have anything to say, we're reaching the end of our, actually, we don't have any limit on this, but um, it's been almost an hour. So yeah. uh, we're, we're going to think about winding up in, in a little bit. Uh, well, Dave, I, have a question. I do have a question. Uh, Go ahead, John. All right, thanks. Um, in Baton Rouge here, I've worked with uh, LIGO, some of the scientists at LIGO, uh -huh. as well as um, with LSU. They, they do a lot of um, 
uh, balloon, high altitude balloon research uh, in the Arctic, actually. And they, uh, a lot of their students are involved. And I've tried to bring some of that research into the planetarium. I, I'm no longer really associated with the planetarium. But uh, I guess the question is, um, how, how are your questions when you initially ask the researchers or try to get them involved in the program, uh, are they um, uh, sympathetic with uh, what you want to do? Or, I mean, do they have your goal right away, or do you have to really um, uh, try to show them step by step of what they want to do? The, the, I guess uh, the in the first contact when I when I talked to the professors or researchers, they had no idea that the planetarium could actually be helpful in sharing information to the, informally to the general public. Uh, so that was really a hurdle to uh, to overcome before they said, well, maybe this, this might be a good idea. Did you encounter anything like oh, that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, that's sort of how this all started. Uh, Harry Stern, who's the PI from the University of Washington, about, I've been in Seattle three and a half years now, coming up on four years now. So sometime in 2015, I think it was, towards the later part of 2015, the, the system I have installed now, I installed in December of 2015. I think we were talking sometime in autumn in 2015. And he, uh, we do a annual polar science weekend. And he was talking to uh, the woman who was our then vice president of education, Ann McMahon, uh, and Kenny, who was at the time director, um, about doing a polar science grant. And I'm not quite sure why they directed him to the planetarium. They knew I was new and I had a lot of ambitious goals for the planetarium perhaps. Uh, but they said, maybe we could do a planetarium show uh, or something. And he was like, well, you know, we don't really look at the stars. So I actually brought him in and showed him some of the things we can do with Landsat imagery and flying and seeing features on the earth. And I also connected him with, uh, Kachun Yu, who some of you may know from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, who has done a considerable amount of research on this subject, and also along with uh, Bob Reynolds, also a geologist, also from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, put together a number of programs, the uh, water story, I think they called it, and a couple of things like that, that they did, no, oh, I guess at least 10 years ago now. Um, but I connected Perry with Kachun and had Kachun talk to him about it. I used to work at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So that sort of was the out, this is sort of the outgrowth of that work there that they were doing. Um, and he got on board and actually became very interested in it. And, um, actually wanted to add the whole um, Arctic under the bears aspect and actually wanted to add the whole, I was not going to do a season's lesson because that's the observational show kind of a thing or that kind of a thing. I was not going to do a season's lesson. I was just going to do a real heart, real planetary science thing. And he wanted to add the seasons thing and it works out really well. And of course, as we all know, we have to keep reminding ourselves how many of our guests don't know why it's summer. So the more often we can do that, the better. Um, so yeah, I had that. And then the same with the eight research side. The, the Science Communication Fellowship is more often than not uh, either post postdocs or uh, still grad students who go through uh, the program uh, or newly minted PhDs in postdocs. Uh, so 
I had to go through that again. And with them, the way I started it out was I actually had um, Laura Grace, who is, uh, she's got a background in both geology and astrobiology. So you put those two things together and you probably go, huh, I wonder if she's interested in Mars. And yes, indeed, the answer would be correct. And for one of her programs that she puts on, she does a really excellent history of the geology of Mars, a geologic history of Mars presentation that is sort of this kind of, it's a planetary science show focused on Mars. So I had her do that for the fellows so that they could see the uh, planetarium while looking at the star, and don't get me wrong, looking at the stars is a hugely important part of being a planetarium. But there's also the looking at the planets themselves. And so that sort of got them inspired. They were pretty scared that they were gonna have to like create the technology and do a lot of that. So I had to reassure them that, no, no, that I'm the one who should be scared about having to create all of that. Uh, but yeah, so that's how that worked. And it was a process of showing them that, yeah, this is an immersive digital environment that can be used as an educational tool to talk about what you do with guests in a way that we might not have thought of before. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, John. Jeff, did you have another thing? You know, funny enough, that was almost exactly my question, too, because I'm at NASA and I'm sitting here uh, with the planetarium and with space science people. And even then, they don't want to touch the planetarium. Uh, it's yeah. to the point where if I want to if I want a scientist in my planetarium, I have to drive it for them while they talk. Right. Yeah. That's just kind of how it is. Nobody wants to drive it. I've tried to make it as simple as possible. You know, you view it's the panels. You press buttons. It's just one step up from a PowerPoint. And I still can't get them to touch it. Yeah. They're like, as long as you're driving, I'll talk. But, um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a challenge. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, with science on a sphere, I can, they're comfortable with the iPad and controlling science on a sphere. But with the planetarium, they don't want to touch it. They want somebody else to drive, which I'm fine with, you know. And since we are concentric, uh, it makes it uh, more of a challenge because you're doing all of your shows in the round so you don't have an audience looking at you. They're all surrounding you. So you've got that additional challenge. We're actually very similar to uh, at least the original Lawrence Hall of Science. I think we were sister uh, planetariums at one point in time. Yeah, you know, I don't blame scientists for not wanting to drive. I, I've done uh, activities at other people's planetariums where I'm not familiar with the system, and I am really grateful for to have somebody else drive. While yeah, I'm absolutely. Activity. Absolutely. I was uh, another, I can't off the top of my head remember, but I had a someone who's coming in uh, September to the uh, live symposium that's going to be here at the Willard Smith who um, doesn't use a sky scan, I think it was. They, but in any case, she didn't use Uniview or Nightshade. And she was asking, are these things possible? I don't know the system. And I was like, yeah, sure. And I'd be happy to drive for you if you're comfortable with that. Because yeah, I, if I was in another planet, if I came to your planetarium, I wouldn't want to touch anything. Um, well, and yeah. even in my own planetarium, I haven't. I haven't led a show in so long. <laughs> I'm not really familiar with the system anymore. So <laughs> I'd just as soon have somebody else drive too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And to further what Jeff was talking about, a lot of uh, where I'm driving things uh, with this comes from that experience at the Gates Planetarium in Denver uh, with Kachoon, with with Dan Nafis and with Greg Mancari experimenting with ways to get scientists into the planetarium uh, with varying degrees of success. So I sort of brought that ethos 
here to try to do a similar thing. And I'm having some success now. And maybe the fact that this is a smaller planetarium in a way makes it easier because uh, it is an intimate setting. We don't have a audience of 250 people judging you. We only have, we, you know, I mean, in some ways having a smaller audience is more intimidating because <laughs> you have to be on. So I have two announcements before we actually close out. Um, okay. You know, if there's other questions, but um, the first is that the next seminar is August 31st, and that's going to be Michael McConville from Spitz. Oh, great! And he's going to talk about it's a it's a it's something that he did previously. Uh, it's about public relations and the planetarium. Uh, oh. The ways that planetarium can take control of their own public. Re Relations. I'm reading from the PPA homepage. They can take control of their own public relations and craft unique and memorable campaigns that connect with the public and build community relationships. Uh, and what's not on the PPA homepage is that um, Christine Schupla from the Lunar Planetary uh, Institute uh, offered to uh, line up a speaker from from her her organization and for uh, you're breaking up Alan for October uh, we're gonna have uh, Julie uh, what's her last name Julie Stopar from the Lunar Planetary Institute, um, talking about the moon at her at area of study. Um, cool. So anyway, sorry I was breaking up. I hope I'm coming through somewhat. Yeah. Um, I guess it's, it's time, to, time to close off now, perhaps. Uh, any other last thoughts or comments? Nothing really. Just thanks for the uh, thanks for everything. That was really good. Yeah, I think we have another in our series of superb Pacific Planetarium seminars. Yeah, I think thanks. We give all ourselves a, a applause for that. I think. Yeah. Thanks for putting this together, Alan. It's really great. Um, and uh, Dave, right. since you're the host, why don't you hover over the leave meeting, and we can all say goodbye. Okay. Or not leave meeting, but end the meeting. End meeting, yeah. Okay, I'm hovering, so... Oh, wait, wait. How about first uh, end the recording? Stop recording. Okay, yeah. Okay.